Hey everybody, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the Eclipse magic that I did and also just give some general updates. So uh, the first opening thing I should say is that Eclipse magic is generally considered to be highly risky, uh, perhaps even malefic in nature. Um, so for that reason, uh, consider well the risks if that's something you're going to do. Um, it seems more and more nowadays there's a slow, slow evolution towards thinking of eclipses in a more chaotic, neutral sense, to quote, I believe it was Diana Rose Harper. Um, but at any rate, I generally would not recommend it for somebody who's just beginning their magical practice, even for a lot of advanced folks. So what was my justification for violating the rule, as it were. Well, the reason goes back to John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica. Now, if you haven't yet, I do recommend, if you are a student of Enochian, a practitioner, or a student of John Dee, I do strongly recommend that you read, uh, well, read a bunch of books, but mainly review and take notes on and get bunch of ideas for additional research on, frankly, because she's an expert on John Dee and she did a fantastic job. And by she, I'm referring to Dr. Terry Burns. And she's done a fantastic job of laying out John Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica with such lucidity that to praise it would, all, would always come up short in terms of doing it justice. So I do recommend just seeing it for yourself and really thinking through absolutely everything that she thought through. The videos, I'm guessing they're on the order of, you know, probably a good 100 to 200 hours worth of material. That, that stuff is golden. That is longer than a university course. Okay, let's just face it. In terms of the amount of the professor just giving you information. So all of that is wonderful. So cutting ahead to the chase a little bit, I had to reshoot this video and do, a, I'm always doing a bunch of more takes whenever Mercury is in Gatorade or retrograde, depending on if you are more sarcastic towards that concept. But usually it means doing a review. So this is a fourth take and why? Because I couldn't find the video number. The video number was number 3A of her videos because she has them listed and she intends to do just one video on the topic, but then it winds up taking three. So she just labels it 3A through 3C, but you're going to want 3A. And in it, she references this latent power that John Dee ascribed to the Monus Hieroglyphica. So before we get into that, what is the Monus Hieroglyphica? This actually precedes John Dee's work on in Enochian by a good 17 years, I want to say. He did a lot of extra work on the side in between, but in terms of his major published works, there's the Monus Hieroglyphica, and then he does a preface to Euclid's Geometry, and then after that, he does, I believe that's the order. Look it up if I'm wrong, who cares? But he has, he has one work in between, but then he moves on to his Enochian work. So with, with Edward Kelly. So the Monus Hieroglyphica, however, is not just something cool that has a lot of mathematics to it, although it certainly has that. And especially in John Dee's day, this would have been a fabulous device for people who are first learning about mathematics and geometry. Instead, though, John Dee ascribed a lot of extra stuff to it. Specifically, he talked about, you, you'll want to, if you, if you can also have another thing to add to your viewing list, you're going to want to watch Dr. Justin Sledge's work on the Monus Hieroglyphica to get a sense, especially I think it's the third video where he talks about this idea this theory of language and linguistics of nominal uh, nominalism when it comes to language theory versus reality or realism. 
So what does that mean? Basically that you can either, you can use something just as a label to put on something. So if I were to name a table, I couldn't name it Grangrox or something like that, right? And it could mean the same thing. It's just the word table, but it just means the same thing. And if, you know, we could sub swap out that word as long as we all understand that. And it doesn't, it wouldn't make a lick of difference. It's the same idea. Then there's the counter view, which is that of realism, which is that no words actually have some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence to that. So the re there's a reason why a table is called table instead of Grangrox. And what is that? You know, it, there's ideas of maybe a holy language, a creation language, that you would see a divine language that God used to create the universe. So Dr. Sledge gets into that. So John Dee seemed to be more of the latter, of the realist school of thought. So when he's cr talking about this Monus Hieroglyphica, the idea is that we have this thing, this symbol, literally it means a sacred carving or sacred symbol uh, that goes beyond just like unity, but rather is like sort of embedded and isomorphic with all of reality. So if we could use this symbol in a proper way, we could suddenly rectify all of reality, okay? So this symbol in, in D's view takes on this additional power. And you see this, if you get into magic, you see what are the barbarous names? What does that mean? What are the barbarous names? The idea is, okay, we're looking for, if you're a magician, you're looking for a certain amount of tech, different, either a different way to do magic, or if you already know how to do magic, you're looking for the, the it's almost like if you're trying to do a nuclear reaction, well, in order to do that, you need uranium, or you need plutonium, or you need something that is radioactive that can get the job done, okay? So when it comes to, to, Enochian, you know, the idea is that the entire language is the equivalent of barbarous words, right? Or something along those lines. So anyway, a barbarous word, getting back to what that means, if you look in various magical texts like the PGM, the Greek magical papyri, it's the order is different because of differences in how words are ordered in different languages. But the idea there in is that if you look through some of those spells, I can just, the one that I've experimented with is the headless right. You know, there are these barbarous words and you're just vibrating them. And, you know, me being clear audience, it's just like, wow, really loud um, in my ears as I do that. Um, so, so there's something special about those words that literally, there's this book called Girdle, Escher and Bach, where they, the, the idea is to create uh, is what would happen if you created a song that destroyed the thing that was that produced the song. You know what it's like. Is there a symbol that can actually destroy the symbol making machine or or influence the symbol making machine? Right. So you can see that little twist in there that that. Oh, well, maybe there is this way to actually have a symbol that has power on reality itself. That's the level of power that we're talking about when it comes to uh, the certain kinds of words, right? Certain words that all of a sudden upend everything or a symbol that upends everything, right? You know, so, so I'm bringing all of this up to A, get you thinking and hope, hopefully thinking differently about why we magicians continually do this. Because not only is there this logic in this book Girdle Escher and Bach uh, Girdle Escher and Bach of that can that shows the power of symbol to work on reality itself from a strictly logical point of view as well as magicians who have this experiential view which in a lot of ways really ought to be considered the stronger point of view if you think about it because there's a whole lot of you know I'm sitting in an armchair right now you know oh I can just you know theorize about this and the other thing but if somebody's just in an armchair telling you about your experience, they do not have the power, the one-up power on you, or let's put it this way, they have a, a huge burden in front of them to prove to you that what you took away from your experience is wrong, right? So, because how would they know? You haven't lived it. You haven't done it. 
blah, 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 blah. And sometimes, on rare occasions, the armchair view wins, and that's, that's basically science, right? Um, but most of the time, the experience wins, and that's also science. So, all right, so we've got this symbol, this power to affect reality. So what is John Dee using this for? Well, he's incorporating the astrological symbolism of the symbol Mercury, combined with the symbol for Aries, combined with the symbol for Taurus, combined with the symbol for the sun and the moon and the cross, having Christian reference, obviously, as well as the elements. And finally, you can also create um, the symbols for the other four planets, as well as them being in their proper proportions. So you can create all of this with a simple straight edge and compass. And it's really beautiful when you actually do that and you do that work. So getting back to what is this symbol supposed to do that made it so important for me to risk eclipse magic, right? So that's the background. At one point during that video three in Dr. Terry Burns's series on the Monus Hieroglyphica, she talks about how there is a latent terrestrial power. So if you actually look at the Monus Hieroglyphica, basically it's a, a, a perfect circle of radius two with the center shown in it, as well as a, another semicircle of the same radius above that that forms the head basically of Mercury, the Mercury symbol, or you could say it's also the sun symbol superimposed. And the implication is that that dot represents the earth in addition to being the center of the sun. And the way she lays it out, and I'll just, I'm trying to do as much of this from memory as I can. The way she lays it out, the symbol for the for the monus hieroglyphica basically what happens is, is that you person on earth wind up becoming kind of invisible or rarely seen and meta definitely metamorphosized okay so transformed and how are you transformed it talks about this union of, she calls it gonetic. She kind of coins that term trying to translate what he has, which suggests kind of like gonads, you know, the whole idea of the union of gametes. And basically that the sun and the moon have this power together. And specifically, he lays out how even though these two things are separate and are in different places later on, they're still having this unified they're still activating this latent terrestrial power. Well, what's that a reference to? An eclipse, right? Where the sun and the moon are perfectly aligned, they're together in the sky, and they're having this power astrologically brought down, okay? So that's, that's the inference that I'm making, is that he is referring to an eclipse. It is not a huge leap if you actually look at, at that portion of the video. So the question then was how to activate it. Well, the if you look at the call received by Freder Soroth, there's multiple references in that call to two lights. So two lights, obviously the sun and the moon, they're literally in astrology referred to as the luminaries or the lights. And there's... Just hang on a second, I've lost my train of thought. So together, then, if you're beholding them, the only way to really do it at once is to either, you know, maybe you have a crescent moon or something like that, but just relatively do it safely. You'd look at, you'd look at, at an eclipse during the totality, or you would activate that power during a totality. So that's what I did. And that's why I just read off that call. Now, I didn't just do that. Um... I actually called up various angels. I called up King Karmara, High King Karmara specifically is his actual, his more formal title, uh, High Prince Hagunel, as well as the kings and princes of the Sun, Moon, and Mercury. Mercury is also in Aries. I could have called on uh, Baganol and uh, Baligon, but I chose not to because those two 
kind of, there's some isomorphism, again, I'll use that word. There's some similarity, or perhaps one is the other-ness, to Karmara and Baligon and Baganol and Hagonel. So I chose not to do to call them, just knowing that they were pretty much already kind of covered. But at any rate, Sun, Moon, Mercury, and Venus, those four together form the four planets in Aries. So Aries also has a particular importance to the Monus Hieroglyphica. It's bringing about this special fire. And I also have uh, three planets domicile, th three planets in, Merc in Aries, I should say. Mars in domicile, which is relatively close to where the conjunct to where that eclipse was, four degrees off. Um, also on an important asteroid of Juno. Uh, you can look that one up, and those of you who are really watching me can really understand what that means if you look up the symbolism of that. So I went ahead and what chose to activate this. So what how what how'd that go, Cliff? <laughs> Well, what happened was kind of interesting. So in this build up to this eclipse, I was already kind of feeling it. And, you know, as you get more attuned to energies, you kind of understand, oh, okay, this is why I'm sleeping weird these last couple days and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then about an hour before the eclipse started over the um, Pacific Ocean, I was starting to get some of that energetic feeling. And that's the only way I can describe it, is that you feel different energetically. If you if you have a sense of kundalini, great. If you don't, you know, that's okay. You know, maybe it'll come along later, but, you know, look at your talents, develop what you can, and just keep going. So, so anyway, I started feeling that. So I started activating the table during the eclipse proper. And I said the calls, and I made my conjurations, and all of that wrapped up about 10 minutes before totality. I got myself together, went outside, and watched the eclipse with my wife. So all of that, um, which by the way was a big deal for her because she's um, because of some of her limitations. So that was a that was a big fun experience to have. So at any rate, I wound up uh making the call during the totality itself, Freder Soroth's call. And, and then I went inside and went about my day. So here's what the way I experienced that, and to some extent I'm still experiencing it, is uh, a level of dissociation. Now, okay, you know, Cliff, haven't you mentioned you have bipolar? Yeah, I have bipolar two, which is the milder of the two, neither one I recommend, uh, on a worst enemy. But at the same time, it also brings gifts, so I'm not complaining. But, uh, so I've also had dissociation in the past. So, if obviously, I'm willing to risk stuff doing magic during an eclipse. But, so I had some dissociation, which I've had before. I know the sensation, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't like, um, it wasn't full dissociation, which I've had before during times of usually extreme stress. But also, um, I was approached uh, on the astral by uh, an angel, this one was male, uh, about a 30 to 40 foot wingspan because this angel had wings. Not all of them do necessarily, or don't always present themselves as in whatever way, but this one did. And I found myself on the astral being encouraged to fly, right? It's like, okay, well, I'm going to try to go out, go throughout the rest of my work day <laughs> with this extra thing going on. So just for those of you who, you know, I mean, this is just sort of the one of the ways that magic can play out. Different parts of your consciousness can be called forward and can be doing things where, whereas other parts of your consciousness may have no idea or like there's only like a vague you know, recognition of each other that each consciousness uh, has to the other. So that's kind of what's been happening with me. So what does this mean? Well, one of the things that I found myself doing at first was flying and then, you know, 
recognizing that flying implies flying from, so you get this, this archetypal Mars, but it also implies flying to, our, which would be like a uniting kind of thing, Venus. Um, there's a changeability, obviously. Um, Mercury is very considered very light and able to do stuff very swift and very changeable, so that's sort of mercurial. And obviously we see depictions of Hermes with uh, sandals with uh, wings on them. And, and so on and so forth. There's probably other things I could do, but it was kind of like across the universe kind of flying. So at first I brought with myself a rope to help, because at first it's like, well, how would I unite things? But then I realized, okay, if I'm going to unite things using my consciousness and what have you, what would what would be better than trying to use a rope? And then it occurred to me, well, seeing what connections are already there, and then a whole like network, massive network, you could call it Indra's net, of various um, connections that already exist. And the specific uh, connections were hearts to each other, all across the whole universe. So there's a great deal of love and and unification energy going on there. So that's the start of something new. Um, I think the fallow period that led up to this was good. Um, just sometimes going through it. I'm still going through it. I'll probably go through it for the rest of my life. It's been very hard the last couple of months. And, um, you know, that's how it goes. You know, life is uh, not without the bitter. It's not without the sweet, but it's also not without the bitter. And that's okay, you know. So that's what's going on. If you have any questions about that, let, uh, about that, let me know. The updates are that um, I'm going to have to work through whatever this is for the next uh, few days. I'm going to try to bear in mind that um, usually before a big ordeal, which is this upcoming Jebbafall ritual. By the way, the angel did not give a name. Um the one who appeared as a result of that call. Um, so usually before this, before an ordeal, the Jebbafall ritual being one of those, um, there's a period of nine days of sanctification. And so I'm going to do my best to at least, you know, it, it's hard. You know, I did, even today I didn't wind up doing all the things I wanted to do, but I was I would also ask the angels, please, you know, whatever I can within wisdom. And they, I think they literally limited what I could do just given the window that I had. So, and the spirit of what I had was already pre-written, so that was fine. So there will probably be another fallow period where you may not get as many videos from me. It's just how it goes. Um, so, yeah. I'm trying to think what else I... So I'm going to be starting that up uh, on the 23rd, and from there I'm going to, um, I'm not sure how often I'm going to post updates, whether it's on YouTube or on my blog, Today. I'm still keeping that, but we'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, obviously I intend to keep it, but I mean, you know, I'm thinking about actually revising my other blog and rebranding it and looking for an auspicious time to do that. But I'm not there yet. What can I say? But I will be working on it. So if you again, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments or reach out through my blog, Enochian.today. Thank you so much for watching. This probably went about, you know, 19 minutes longer than I intended but I guess I had to cover a lot more stuff than I thought. So, all right. Thank you all so much. Have a good one. Love you all. And remember to uh, love your neighbor as yourself and to love God. All right. Bye.